excited to be here. Um, we're going to talk about the research that we've been doing uh, in North Dakota regarding managing soil acidity. So I'm going to talk about some band-aid treatments as well as we've been working hard to try to develop a recipe to fix these acid impacted acres. And so a couple things I wanted to share first is every Tuesday we have a weekly update that comes out of the Dickinson Research Extension Center. You can go to our website, scroll all the way down, put your email in there and you're added to uh, the list. And we have livestock and agronomy programs at Dickinson. And so one week will be agronomy, the next week will be livestock related. The other thing that we've started doing is uh, a YouTube channel. Uh, right now we have about 12 videos up there. I had a mass communications intern last year that has about 10 or so more videos uh, to complete before uh, the coming growing season. But um, every other week or so we've been putting another video on our YouTube channel. And uh, there's a couple of videos on there, uh, Liming Research in North Dakota Soils, as well as uh, one talk from our field day that'll kind of highlight what I'm going to talk about today. Um, other things we have up there, some of our sulfur research and uh, our livestock production. So uh, first I want to throw out a handful of definitions out there. We hear about salinity, sedicity, alkalinity, those sorts of things. What are we talking about? Salinity, we're talking about salt. That's the white stuff that we usually find these in our lower, wetter areas of the field. So you can see it. Sedicity. That means you have too much sodium in the soil and they make the soils hard and compacted. Then we have acid, that has a pH less than seven. We don't get concerned about soil acidity unless that pH gets about 5.5 or less. Once it starts getting below six, it's time to start thinking about addressing that issue. Alkalinity or alkaline, pH is greater than seven. Sometimes you can see it if you have a lot of carbonates in your soil, like we do uh, across the Dakotas. Usually that's in the subsoil though, not near the surface. Alkali, most of the farmers in North Dakota use this term to talk about the saline areas. Um, alkali is an old, more so archaic term that um, soil scientists use that to describe sodic soils or those sodium impacted soils. <coughs> And so this is what a saline soil looks like, lower, wetter areas of those fields. When things get dry, they get all white. When the field is wet, it doesn't have that white look in it because these salts dissolve in water. They're water-soluble salts. They're there, but they're dissolved in that, that soil solution. Once things uh, dry out though, they precipitate out, that field gets, uh, gets that white appearance, and what's happening here is that salt is holding on to the water and preventing water uptake from the crops you want to grow there. This is what a sodic field looks like. And we measure that by, um, by the sodium absorption ratio test, which looks at sodium, which disperses and repels the soil because it has a plus one charge, versus calcium and magnesium have plus two charges, so they help give that soil structure. So this test is looking at how much sodium versus calcium magnesium is in the soil. Um, when that number's over uh, 13, we consider that, so that soil sodic and we can remediate it with gypsum. Um, but also if you're digging holes and you see these sorts of soil structures, we call them columnar. They kind of look like a KFC biscuit top. The only time you see this in the soil is when you have excess sodium. Other things? you have these plant roots that run lateral because when these soils dry out, they get hard like concrete. And when they get wet, there's no bottom to it. If you get really, really stuck and you say there was no bottom in that field with your tractor, maybe you got a sodic soil. Because what's happening is with all this sodium, they're repelling from each other and they're plugging up the macro and micro pores within the soil. So there's no soil structure and the soil just kind of fails and falls apart under these conditions. So like I said, gypsum, that's for fixing uh, sodic soils. It can also be used as a sulfate fertilizer. It's not an effective liming product. We've got a couple demonstrations we're going to talk about so we get our um, chemistry all squared away before we leave today. So the rest of the talk now, we're going to focus on soil acidity. Okay? So in some instances, you can purposely lower your soil pH. And to do that, you can add elemental sulfur. 
Egg vice up in Northwood, they tried this thought, and they added 10,000 pounds of elemental sulfur. They started with a pH of 8. Uh, a few months later, they did decrease that soil pH to 7.5, but it went back up. And that's because there's a whole bunch of calcium carbonate present in the soil. And if you really want to try to lower your soil pH, so you might have some funky pHs of 8 or so out here, if you do, that's a sign that you maybe have a sodium issue. But um, until you dissolve all of this calcium carbonate, which is limestone, that pH acidity is not going to decrease. So we can't really effectively or agronomically lower our pH. If you want to have some blueberries behind your house where you're talking a little planter to have a low pH, you can make that work. But when we're talking thousands of acres, it's not really economically feasible. So there's not much we can do to improve a high pH but if we got an acid pH, there's things we can do. So we're talking about pH, it's the concentration of hydrogen. And it's this log-based scale, which means that when we go from a pH of 5 to a pH of 4, there is 10 times more hydrogen present in that pH of 4 versus a pH of 5. Now if we go from a pH of 5 to a pH of 3, where we're much more acidic, that's 10 times 10, so that's a hundredfold uh, increase in the hydrogen concentration in this pH of 3 uh, versus the pH of 5. Scale runs from 0 to 14. Hydrogen causes acidity. Hydroxyl, or this OH, causes alkalinity, okay? So systems or solutions that have high pHs have a lot of hydroxyls and not much hydrogen, okay? And a pH of 7 is neutral, and it's made out of H2O, so it has equal parts hydrogen and equal parts hydroxyl, okay? So that's how that works. And it's this inverse scale, so when we say acidity is increased, pH is decreasing, okay? And so like I said, pH less than 7 is acidic, 7 is neutral, greater than 7 is alkaline. We don't get too excited about pH management until that pH is less than 5.5. I got a slide showing up why. <coughs> okay, so to get things straight, calcium does not influence pH, okay? Because hydrogen causes acidity, calcium has a plus 2 charge, so that's like sticking two positive magnets against each other. They're going to repel, okay? But carbonate, which is a big component of lime, which is CO3, this guy has a negative charge. So these two can react. It's all of a sudden we're putting a positive and a negative magnet against each other, okay? Calcium does not influence pH or will not increase pH. So here's a demo that we're going to start. We have three different things going on. We have gypsum, which is calcium sulfate. We have lime, and then we also have a control. And so when we test this stuff, uh, when you send it off to the lab, you want to use distilled water. I just use bottled water. Tap water is probably okay. Um, but they use equal parts water, equal parts soil. You mix it up. You want to let it sit for about 20 minutes. There's all sorts of uh, probes you can get out of there from Amazon that will run like 100 bucks. They work pretty good for the most part. Um, I stopped at Petco in Bismarck on my way through to pick up some litmus paper because I figured showing uh, colors on litmus paper would be a little bit more impactful than holding up my little meter that you guys wouldn't be able to see. So what we're going to do first is just add some gypsum to the soil. And we're going to come back and visit this in about 20 minutes. So we give these different soil amendments some time to react, okay? So there's gypsum, that's calcium sulfate. Here's lime, that is calcium carbonate. And these are just, I picked these up at Menards the other day, it was like 40 below up in North Dakota and like everything else when it's really cold and windy out, why do the parking lots have to face the northwest on the coldest of days? So we'll come back and visit this in a little bit, okay? And then we also have the control, which didn't receive anything. So that's just soil and water, okay? So causes of pH. 
parent material or the minerals from which the soils come from have the largest influence on what that pH is going to be. Areas that are acidic naturally have granitic or volcanic origins. There's a lot of sulfur that comes out of volcanoes, so that's a big reason why uh, those sorts of parent materials are acidic. Now, in the Dakotas, we got lots of limestone. Granted, not so much of it up at the surface anymore, but we have lots of limestone because if we back up 70 million years, there used to be mosasaurs uh, swimming around here. So we had ancient uh, ocean beds that as the North American continent moved to the west and started forming the Rocky Mountains, we had this uplift thing, so we're no longer in the ocean, but we had all that sediment out there. Nitrogen fertilizer is another culprit. And it doesn't matter if you're using anhydrous or urea, um, manure, ammonium sulfate, all of that nitrogen at some point is going to mineralize or nitrify and turn into nitrate, which the plants are going to use. So here's what that chemical reaction looks like. We have urea here, and you add some water, then you got some soil microbes doing their thing to nitrify those products, and it's the same thing that happens with mineralization of manure or organic residues, but hydrogen gets released during this nitrification process. Hydrogen is the most common element in the entire universe, so there's no shortage of hydrogen. That's what the sun and all the stars are predominantly made out of, so there's no shortage of hydrogen. And so hydrogen gets released which is then added to the active soil pool, which then influences the pH and increases uh, the uh, soil acidity. So over time, soils acidify. The another thing that they're gonna do, they're gonna free up aluminum. And we'll talk a little bit more about aluminum toxicity and how it can be kind of a snowball on, um, on our soil pHs. So this is a chart uh, from, um, one of our good old soil textbooks, Havlin, right? Yep, Havlin. We have this in our uh, extension circular on soil acidity management. And this is just showing our different nitrogen sources, the fertilizer analysis, and how much lime is required to neutralize each pound of nitrogen given from the various fertilizers. So urea and anhydrous ammonia, every pound of nitrogen you get from there, you need 1.8 pounds of calcium carbonate to offset it, okay? Now, if you put anhydrous down, if you were to test your pH immediately after, you're actually gonna see a slight increase because there's hydroxide associated with it. However, as it nitrifies and becomes nitrate, that's the NO3 plant available stuff, the hydrogen's gonna get released and still at the end of the day, you'll have a net decrease of soil pH. Monomonium phosphate, 11520. Each pound of nitrogen from that, you're gonna need about 5.4 pounds of calcium carbonate to offset that. And we see the same thing with ammonium sulfate. Um, diammonium phosphate's a little bit less. Uh, your UAN solution is 28, 32% nitrogen, about 1.8. So it doesn't matter what you put down, even the composts and the manures, it's slowly gonna acidify. Now using those sorts of things, throwing legumes into the crop rotation where you're going to have um, that nitrogen credit, that's going to slow down the, acidi the, the acidification process. But still, at the end of the day, things are going to want to acidify. Hydrogen is the most uh, common element in the universe. Okay, so when I talked about why we get concerned about certain pHs, this is why. We have different nutrients here, and we have soil pH here. Green is kind of signifying the ideal pH, which would be about a 6.3 to maybe a 7.2. But if your pH is 5.5 to 7.5, that's a pretty darn good pH and I wouldn't be too concerned. We can't lower pH agronomically, but we can raise it agronomically. And so what's going on here is each one of these nutrients, the wider they are, the more relative plant available they are. So things that we get really concerned about with soil pH, do we have iron chlorosis issues in South Dakota? I know North Dakota is an absolute hotbed. Uh, iron under alkaline conditions is not plant available. It gets 
very, very unplant available with pHs of 7.5 or greater. Phosphorus, we hear about phosphorus all the time and it getting tied up with calcium under alkaline conditions. Good thing we run the Bray, excuse me, not the Bray, uh, the Olson phosphorus test, which works really well to um, determine if phosphorus is deficient or sufficient, regardless of the soil pH. But when soil pHs become acidic, phosphorus can tie up with aluminum. When phosphorus becomes, or if soil pH gets too alkaline, calcium and magnesium can tie up phosphorus. Sulfur, potassium, nitrogen isn't too impacted by soil pH but soil biology is. The bacteria, when that pH gets less than 5.5, the rhizobia that fix nitrogen for our soybeans, for our alfalfas, for our dry beans, any sort of legume, their activity decreases. And so nitrogen deficiencies are a little bit more common in those. And then we take a yield uh, loss. Other things that happen to the nitrosomous bacteria that are naturally in the soil and help with this mineralization process, their activity is greatly reduced once that pH gets 5.5 or less. So I said phosphorus deficiencies are more common. We see purpling of our older leaves uh, in our small grains, or you might see it in corn as well, but it's the older leaves because phosphorus is a plant mobile nutrient so the plant is going to take the phosphorus from this older leaf, cannibalize it, and translocate it to the newer growth. So newer leaves look healthy, older leaves look sick. We also see reduction in root mass because phosphorus plays a huge role in uh, root health of our small greens. You might see things like this where this was an oopsie with, with one of our plots uh, one year where the phosphorus uh, got plugged up on a couple of rows. But you can see the difference in plant height because there's a phosphorus uh, deficiency there. So like I said, pH influences bacteria. And what's going on here, we have a pH of 5.1, which is where we start expecting um, a hit in uh, bacteria activity to a pH of 4.5. Soybeans look pretty decent, and as that acidity increases, the plant decreases. But when you start looking at your roots, these nodules, all of a sudden in the middle here, we don't see nodules anymore, so these plants are starved of nitrogen. <coughs> so when that pH gets less than 5.5, aluminum enters the soil solution. We have lots of aluminum in our soils. Our clays are made up of sheets of aluminum and silica. Okay? It's there physically, but it's chemically inert until that pH gets less than 5.5. If you have a pH of like six and tested it for uh, soil extractable aluminum, it might be one part per million or zero. It's not gonna hardly have, uh, have anything there. But the moment that pH gets less than 5.5, aluminum enters that soil solution and starts messing with things. So what happens with aluminum, it has a plus three charge, which is like a super huge magnet in that soil. And everything at the end of the day wants to have a net zero charge. So we got lots of water in the soil. Hydrogen's gonna take that water, excuse me, aluminum's gonna take that water where it has H and OH, and it's gonna free up the H, because hydrogen is still positively charged, but it's a much smaller um, atom in that soil, so it's a smaller magnet. It's still positively charged magnet, but a much smaller one. So this aluminum, is gonna free up hydrogen and split three water molecules because that OH, three of those hydroxyls are gonna to bind to that aluminum and so it releases hydrogen. And what happens with working with farmers with some of these areas, they might see their pH slowly decrease maybe a tenth of a point every year. That pH is 5.5 one year. The following year, all of a sudden it drops to like a 4.7 or something, a big jump. And what's going on is this uh, snowball effect of that aluminum being freed up. And so some states with their, um, with their lime recommendations, they base it off of what that aluminum soil test is and not so much hydrogen. They're just trying to fight off aluminum. And so um, aluminum, excess aluminum, also has a toxic effect on the soil where when those numbers get greater than 25 parts per million, it's going to abnormally... Um, make those roots be abnormally shaped. 
So when you're dealing with semi-arid agriculture like we already are, it's going to uh, make those drought times much more tough on that plant. It's going to reduce nutrient uptake. All sorts of things like that. pH is um, one of the greatest influences on our soil because it influences nutrient availability, chemical weathering, as well as biological activity. <coughs> oh, we don't need to go over that one. So this is what aluminum toxicity can look like in wheat. This is... Um, some wheat that was taken where the pH was somewhere around 6 and then a little bit ways over we have uh, wheat that's not looking too happy and the pH was somewhere around 5 and it had uh, a higher aluminum test. Uh, this is some work that we had at the research center up in Minot in the foreground uh, on this durum where it's sparsely grown um, where the plant density is nowhere near as good as the back. pH is 4.5 uh, a couple tons of lime, we increase that pH to 5.8, and we have a much better uh, establishment uh, of that crop. Uh, there's a bunch of things going on here. This is taken over in southwest North Dakota. I know that this farmer uh, fertilized properly, but because the pH wasn't good, there's a lot of things going on. One, we have sparse growth, so that's a sign of that aluminum toxicity in acidic soils. If you look, some of these leaves have that chlorotic look on the tips. So I'm thinking of nitrogen deficiency. Other things, there's this wheat right in the foreground there that's starting to have that purple look to it. So I'm thinking phosphorus deficiency. So this pH is doing all sorts of things, messing with that plant, even though it was properly um, planted and fertilized, all those sorts of things. This is what aluminum toxicity of canola looks like. In the left, we have four tons of lime, pH of 5.7, two parts per million of aluminum. On the right-hand side, pH is 4.4, no lime, 62 parts per million of aluminum. And if you look, this is a pretty wimpy looking uh, root. There's no hairs coming off of there, whereas this one is much more robust. Are those pH readings 0 to 3 or 0 to 6 there? This one was a 0 to 6 test. Then we're also seeing manganese toxicity in some extreme um, instances. We have four tons of lime back here, pH of 5.7, no lime 4.4. The aluminum, or excuse me, the manganese toxicity, when we first saw it, we were thinking it was a potassium deficiency because it has this chlorotic look on the leaf margins. But after putting some different fertilizers on, tissue tests, all that sort of stuff, we're able to diagnose and verify that this is a manganese toxicity. Um, the manganese toxic plants have 1,600 parts per million manganese on their tissue tests. The threshold is about, a, a normal range is 10 to 100. So this is a tenfold times more manganese, and that's why we're saying that's toxic. pH also impacts uh, herbicides. Who here has a weed issue? So if your pHs are too acidic, sometimes, like with your... Um, imidazolines, um, they're going to persist, persist a lot longer in that soil and be more available. So you might see more damage than what you'd be accustomed to. If pHs are too high, it's gonna, it can do the same thing. So pHs, at the end of the day, they influence almost everything that we're going to do out there when we farm. Okay, so some things that are going on with our soils in the Dakotas is, like Dwayne said, we have some relatively young soils if you're east of the Missouri River. So this is North Dakota, Sakakawea, Devil's Lake, to give you an idea. But the Missouri River essentially was a big border for where the glaciers stopped 100,000 years ago. If you're West River, you have older soils and you have predominantly kaolinite parent materials or kaolinite clays. If you're east of the Missouri River, you have what's probably called schmectite. And so these clays, we call the schmectites two-to-ones. They're clays that, are, that expand when they're wet. They're, they contract when they're dry. Um, if we had a really good microscope, it would look like a sandwich where you have a piece of bread. Um, then you have some bologna, and you have another piece of bread on top of it. And these are the sheets of aluminum and uh, silicates that I was talking about earlier. Kaolinite is a piece of bread with bologna. It doesn't have this extra piece of bread on top. So that's a one-to-one -one clay. 
And so because of the kaolinite clays, they don't have, and this open face sandwich, they have less cation exchange capacity than what we see in the schmectitic soils. So they don't buffer a change of pH as well as the schmectites. So generally speaking, the soil acidity issues are more widespread in these kaolinite areas. And this is highlighted by these darker areas. Um, in the Dickinson area right here, uh, this was a map developed by Dr. Dave Franzen, um, where we took three samples uh, in every county to develop this map where we, we adjusted our potassium recommendations based off of your clay mineralogy. But uh, in the Dickinson area where this big plume comes through down into Lemon, South Dakota and whatnot, there was 78% kaolinite clay found in those soils. But in these lighter grade soils and the white soils, schmectite was the predominant clay. So um, because of that, the different types of sandwiches some soils are a little bit more prone to acidification than others. Uh, so even back in the mid-90s, we had some soil acidity issues in North Dakota. Uh, this was taken very similar to how that previous map was drawn. Uh, three soil samples from each uh, county and, and each sample was collected from a hilltop, a side slope, and a depressional area. And what this shows in the red is a pH of 5.5 with the side slopes we had some soil acidity issues even back then. But what really shows in the depressional areas, carbonates are deeper in those areas, so you don't have that natural liming effect. And those areas, depressional areas, are more prone to soil acidification than hillsides, okay? Egg vice every year, they come out with uh, a synopsis or summary of all the soil tests that they're seeing um, from year to year. So in 2022, uh, in our area, anywhere from 21 to 16 to 15 percent of the soils had a pH of 6.0 or less. So there's definitely some soils in this area that could benefit from some liming. Up in the Dickinson area, about 16 percent of our soils were acidic. So one of the things that we tried to do, uh, since this is a relatively new problem to North Dakota farmers, is develop a soil sampling protocol. So we took a whole bunch of samples across the state in known acid areas. Uh, on our y-axis, we have our soil pH, and then we divvied out those soil, P, uh, those, th those soil depths a little differently. We analyzed the zero to six inch, and we compared it in two inch increments, zero to two, two to four, and four to six. And then we also compared it from a zero to three and a three to six uh, soil pH. Different letters indicate statistical difference. Similar letters, they're the same statistical category. What we found in North Dakota, and most of our um, fertilizer is surface applied or narrow uh, uh, banded shallow in the soil, uh, our most acidic soils are in that zero to three inch depth. Um, I'm working with a couple, we have a couple farmers that do uh, deep band their, um, uh, their anhydrous. We don't have much anhydrous anymore like we did 20 years ago. We're, we're kind of moving away from that. But a couple areas, we do have some deeper acid issues. The other thing is if you're putting it deep enough, it might be naturally uh, reacting with carbonates if you have carbonates in your soil. Uh, zero to two, similar but a little bit higher, but a similar pH of zero to six. So what we're recommending in North Dakota is look at that zero to three inch soil just for pH. I still want a zero to six for my standard nutrient test, but if I'm trying to find my acid acres, I wanna be looking at a three inch soil. The other thing that happens is when you have larger seeded crops, such as sunflowers and field peas, you're probably putting them two or three inches down. This is capturing that environment much better than the zero to six inch. So you know what that zone is for your seed a little bit more. The other thing is if you've ever soil sampled, it takes about six or seven zero to sixes to fill that, that pint bag up to send it off to the lab. So the zero to three inch, it takes about 12 samples to get, get enough to collect it to the lab. And if you go at a zero to two, all of a sudden you're talking like 20 samples to send it off to the lab so they got enough volume to test it. So 
Um, there's some other things that go into that zero to three, why um, we're, we're suggesting to test that in North Dakota. <coughs> so how do I find these areas? Well, we talked about soil sampling. That's the most important thing to do when it comes to soil management, regardless of what you want to do. But precision agriculture is going to be your friend. Zone sampling is going to be better than grid sampling, but grid sampling is going to be better than a whole field approach. Here's why. This is what that typical catena or hill slope is going to look like. We have our summit, our shoulder, back slope, and uh, foot slope or depressional area. We have our A horizon in the black. We have our B horizons in these lighter browns. Then you got your C horizon in the, the gravelly looking stuff. But that K stands for carbonates. Um, Germans and Russians found, uh, were, were really the, uh, the founders of soil science. So there's some German word that starts with a K that means carbonates. That's why sometimes if you look at a soil map, our alphabet's a little backwards. You can blame the Germans and Russians for that. Um, but at the summits and the depressional areas, these BK horizons or the carbonates, the limestone that's naturally in the soils, they're deeper in that soil profile. Because as you get that rain cloud that goes across that landscape and everybody gets an inch, the carbonates have, get that rainfall and they have a chance to leach those carbonates deeper in that profile. The same thing at the bottom of the hill. However, on our shoulders and our hill slopes, some of that water is going to hit and it's going to run off. Some of it's going to hit and leach into the soil. But because there's, excuse me, less leaching going on here, those carbonates tend to be higher or near the surface on side hills, and that is why uh, acid acres tend to be less prevalent in side slopes versus your summits or your depressional areas. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some Band-Aid treatments for these areas. Crop selection can have a huge impact, um, as our wheats are some of the more tolerant um, our small grains in general are some of our more acid tolerant crops. Y axis we have our yield, X axis we have our soil pH. Any of our um, legume crops, whether it's soybeans or peas or alfalfa, because they need that rhizobia to thrive, they have good uh, yields, they drop off really fast under acidic conditions. Um, variety selection can also play a huge role. We've done a couple of years of evaluating different varieties under acid conditions uh, in, in North Dakota. And so this, some of this stuff is available in, in your handouts and is also available on our website. Uh, Jody Bow, uh, she was with AgVice, she just left them a couple of weeks ago, um, but she farms over in the Beulah area, which is right along Lake Sakakawea, kind of in the central part uh, of our state. And um, she's been doing some liming on her family farm. Um, this is looking at surface applied lime and evaluating that soil pH two and a half years later. We have pH on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have our different rates of lime. And so with two and a half tons of lime, they were able to increase the soil pH uh, by about three quarters of a unit. Half a ton, uh, they got a little bit of a bump, but they really needed about a ton to a ton and a half to see an improvement of that soil pH. And so when we're talking about lime, we're talking about tons, not pounds, but tons. We have tried some in-furrow stuff, thinking, well, if we can put 100 pounds of lime in furrow, can that localize it? Um, we haven't seen a response on some of those trials uh, at, in Dickinson. Uh, so like I said, with zone uh, sampling, um, that's going to be your friend to try to really pinpoint those acid acres. Okay, so not all liming materials are equal, okay? There are some that are more effective than others. It's just to keep in mind that if you're using a different material, you need to account for it, okay? So we got calcitic limestone. That's this stuff that we used. You have calcium carbonate, and it's anywhere from 80 to 100%. Marl, that's ground up uh, seashells, 70 to 90. Then you have dolomitic limestone, has a little bit more carbonate in there, also has some magnesium, so it has a little bit stronger um, calcium carbonate equivalents because it has a little bit more carbonate. Then you have this quick lime, calcium oxide, because that oxygen reacts really fast 
and can react more hydrogen than this carbonate, it has a greater calcium carbonate equivalence. Uh, so there's other things out there too. Even wood ash has some value to increase that soil pH. Uh, some of our producers are starting to call their local municipalities and get some of that water treatment line, except they, they need to stage it on their field for about two years in the corner to let it dry out because it's, there, there's too much water in it uh, to make application really uh, um, possible. So the stuff that I've been working with uh, and some of my research I'm going to share about with, um, with, with lime recommendations is sugar beet waste lime. So we got a number of sugar beet factories in North Dakota. There's half a dozen of them uh, in the Red River Valley. Uh, but then there's also one in Sydney, Montana, which is straight west of Williston and sits right on the Montana-North uh, Dakota border. So that's where we've been getting our lime. Uh, that beet factory is now closed, so that product isn't currently available to our farmers. But um, at some point, if you're interested in what beet lime looks like, I did bring some, so um, you're welcome to take a look at it uh, before we head out. Anyways, with the beet lime, there's a little bit of nitrogen, has a decent amount of phosphorus in it. We're seeing our phosphorus tests increase, a hint of potash. And if you're using these sorts of products, whether it's beet lime, water treatment lime, or whatever, Test it on a regular basis so you know how much is in there so you're not shortchanging yourself and you're not putting too much down. Our beet lime is ranged anywhere from as low as 50% to as high as about 80%. The stuff that uh, we used for this particular project is sitting right around 75%. Okay, so how does lime neutralize acidity? I want to show a couple products. There might be some jugs that say liquid lime on them. Check to see what the label says. Carbonates don't really dissolve in water, but calcium chloride does. And we see that as an active ingredient on a lot of products that might be called liquid lime. Here's what happens. That calcium chloride reacts with two hydrogen. Hydrochloric acid is HCl. So that's all that's going to happen. It's not going to really decrease your soil pH. Or you might have gypsum. That's this stuff. We're going to show that, talk about that a little bit when we test this. That is calcium sulfate. That's going to react with some hydrogen and it's going to make sulfuric acid. That's what's in batteries. Not going to really do much to that soil pH. Calcium doesn't react with hydrogen because they're positively charged. Carbonates, because that's negatively charged. Oxides, hydroxides, they're negatively charged. They're going to react with hydrogen. So calcium carbonate reacts with hydrogen. You got some calcium, you got some water, you got some CO2. If you've ever seen somebody do a soil pit, they probably have a bottle of acid because all of us soil scientists like dripping acid on a regular basis. And we put it on that soil profile and we're looking for an effervescence or a fizz, okay? And so what's happening there, the hydrochloric acid is reacting with the carbonate and it's producing some CO2. So that's what causes the bubbling. If you ever made a... Uh, a volcano when you were a kid. This is the same premise as what's going on. You have some baking soda and you got some vinegar. Calcium hydroxide can um, neutralize more hydrogen. That's why it had that, heart, that higher calcium carbonate equivalence value. <coughs> okay, so back to the demo. So we had some gypsum here. And then we had some lime. And then we have our control, because we're good scientists and we, we always run a blank, right? So we got some litmus paper. Well, like I said, this was a aquarium test strips that they had at Petco. Put one in there, one in there, one in there. Probably should have read the instructions before, huh? Okay. Can you hold on to this? That's gypsum. And you got lime, okay? Okay. 
So we got the control here. I got the control. So what is that pH? We're going to be looking at this guy. Uh, seven. About seven. Okay. And I gave you gypsum, That's right? right? That's right. What would you say that is? That is five and a half. Five and a half. What do we got here? Right there on that guy. Would you call that about maybe a seven and a half? Yeah, that looks like it. Seven, seven and a half, okay. So with the lime that I added, we raised the pH a little bit, right? With the gypsum I added, did we drop the pH of here? We, we, we did, okay? Because here's what's happening. It, it, it's, it's not necessarily, um, you know, when you add these products, it, yeah, Chris said that it's going to make hydrochloric acid, and that's true, but it's the hydrogen that dissociates or gets released in that, um, in that soil solution. What happened with the calcium, it bonded to the cation exchange sites of that soil because it's the bigger magnet versus the hydrogen. It's a plus two versus a plus one charge of the hydrogen. So that bonded to the soil and then it freed up the hydrogen that got released into that soil solution. So it had a localized acidity impact because of the calcium. Okay? We do have calcium deficiencies from time to time in, in the Dakotas and adding some liquid lime or adding some um, you can turn the lights off now. Thank you, Jason. Um, uh, we, 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 we can remediate that by adding liquid lime type products, but we're not going to Im improve that soil pH. Okay. <coughs> so not all liming products are equal. Not all particle sizes are equal. The finer the product, the more it's going to react, the faster it's going to react with that soil, and you're going to have a better and faster change in soil pH. So when you're looking at different products, they talk about mesh size. Um, and this is based on a square inch. So you got 10 holes per square inch. If the product doesn't sift through there, we call that relatively inert. But if we get it to fall through the 10 to 50 uh, mesh size, we call that 50% of that will react with the soil over maybe a growing season or two. When that product, all of it goes through that 50 mesh size, it's really fine. That's what we see in this beet lime. It's like a flower. And uh, even though there might only be 70% um, lime in this product versus the store-bought in lime is like 98, 99%. Um, if we put the same amount of calcium carbonate equivalents on this versus this product, we'll have a faster change in pH because it's a finer uh, particle and it's going to react with the soil faster than the coarser um, material. So when we started trying to develop these recommendations, um, we ran every soil test under the sun. I got well over 6,000 soil data points for this whole project. And what I should have done is taken a lesson from one of my instructors and went with the KISS method where I got to keep it simple, stupid, I'm stupid. So things like calcium, uh, cation exchange capacity, aluminum, organic matter, clay type, soil texture, they can influence soil pH. And so we ran all of that stuff. And at the end of the day, I should have just done what all every other state has done to develop Lyme recommendations and looked at what we call the buffer test. So when you get your normal soil test, that's active pH. That's what um, is uh, looking at the, the current pH of the soil. That's what we did here. But if we add a small salt solution like gypsum, all of a sudden that's measuring the buffering ability of the soil a little bit. So there's these different ways to, to measure the buffer ability in different tests. So what we first did uh, is we looked at a couple different tests. Socora is what's typically run in the Midwest. Um, before that used to be the SMP soil test. It was developed in Ohio State, but it has some toxic chemicals like chromium with it. So the soil testing labs were looking to run something different so they didn't have to deal with the EPA as much. And so this Socora test was developed and found to be very similar. So now if you send something to a testing lab, they're probably running Socora. <coughs> 
Adams and Evans was something that was developed in the southeast in an area that's rich in kaolinite clay. So our hypothesis, hypothesis was first, well, maybe we should run the Socorro East River and run the Adams and Evans West River. Thinking, you know, back to that map with that plume of kaolinite that I showed. And what this is telling us with our R squared value of just about one, so that's about as perfect as you're going to ever get, it doesn't matter what test you go with, just pick a test. So everything that I'm going to be talking about here on out is based on this Socorro buffer pH test, okay? Um, so we've done some stuff with lime and we looked at aluminum. We have a couple different treatments of lime here. And we found that it does impact the amount of aluminum. Y axis is showing how much aluminum, X axis is showing, showing soil pH. And when we start breaking everything down, we have our control somewhere around 60 parts per million of aluminum. This is where some of those pictures that I was showing earlier with the sick looking canola and sick looking durum came from. Two tons, we see an improvement of pH as well as aluminum. When we get to four and eight tons of lime, we see a similar uh, response. And that goes back to that logarithmic scale that hydrogen and soil acidity is based off of, okay? Um, other things that we've tried, uh, we've, we've applied lime in the springtime, then we come back and look in the fall. Um, this is our soil depth. We looked at two inch increments to six inches, then we took a six to 24 inch soil test. We have initial pH, and then we have two tons of beet lime and four tons of beet lime. And what we've seen, uh, over a number of years of doing this sort of work, we can move lime about four inches into the soil profile over the course of one growing season. And this is all surface applied, no incorporation. And so this is now starting, we're gonna get into actually, my pH is this, Chris, how much lime do I need? Here, here's where we're, I'm gonna be able to tell you. Um, my secretary looked at me really weird when I came in one day and I said, I need you to order me 500 hula hoops. Um, what we did is we had sites all across the state. We took these hula hoops and we put lime on the inside. Before that, we did some very extensive soil sampling a foot outside of the hula hoop. Um, the work that's been done to develop lime recommendations involve incubations and greenhouses. Problem is under a no-till system, you collect that soil and bring it back to the greenhouse, that's no longer no-till, you disturbed it. You, you don't have that structural integrity of the pore space and the, the water flows and all those sorts of things. So we did an in situ uh, incubation study, if you will. So here's our crew of uh, students and interns putting lime down. And then this is what the site looked like afterwards. So we screened the sites, farmers went and planted their stuff. Shortly after planting, we came out, we soil sampled, we limed. Farmers did whatever they normally would. Shortly after harvest, we came out and we did that soil, same soil sampling protocol, but inside the hoop, okay? So we're comparing the outside of the hoop, you know, within a foot versus the inside of the hoop. If we would have taken soil samples inside the hoop then put on lime, that would have skewed stuff because all of a sudden we got these big macro pores that the uh, lime could wander down. And so we had sites all across the state. We had 24 sites over the course of two years, the majority of which would be in that kaolinite rich area, West River. And we even had stuff um, back where I'm originally from. Um, I got a classmate uh, that has been no-tilling for 10 years and he's got some soil acidity issues now. Um, but we had some stuff East River, majority of it was West River. So when we first started looking at this data, like I said, I had every soil test under the sun. I should have just kept it simple, stupid, and just look at the buffer pH. We also tried dividing these areas based on, are they West River, are they East River, what's the clay mineralogy, those sorts of things. Because over here in Dickinson on a good year, we're gonna get about 14 inches of precipitation that includes snowfall. Back here where I'm from, they're gonna get 22 inches of rainfall. So that can have a huge influence on how stuff is gonna react with the soil. The more water you have, the more reaction you're probably gonna have because there's a greater potential for it to leach into that soil profile. So on our y-axis, we have tons of calcium carbonate equivalents. So when I said this is running about 75%, when we put one ton of this down, we actually had to put a little closer to one and a half tons down because this isn't 100% lime, okay? Oops, what did I do? Okay. And so we had some areas where it wasn't so good, 
our R squared value is 0.4. And we had some areas, again, here's our lime treatment, here's our soil pH, so this is fall pH, where we had really good R squared values. So that's great. Then we went in and we you know, made all these um, equations that are hard to read, but we made this really easy chart. And the way it works is you got an acid soil, you get your buffer pH test, maybe it's 6.3, and you want a pH of 6. Our recommendation is to put 3.9 tons of lime down, okay? Problem is, we didn't have environments that were 6.0, 6.2, 7.0. And also, some of these environments weren't statistically significant. So we went and did some statistics. Uh, I worked with some statisticians to do the stepwise procedure, which this is what I was envisioning to begin with. But nobody here wants to take a million other soil tests. So that, that's buffer pH. But we, we took all these things into account, the lime treatments, the buffer pH, organic matter, aluminum, cation exchange capacity, and we're able to fill in the gaps. Problem is, the gaps at 7.0 and 7.1, that data is saying you need to remove lime from the soil. So the, that equation fails under that range. So then, this is the actual, like, what I would recommend uh, you to apply. Um, we did some more data manipulation, worked with some colleagues to get things adjusted. I'm still waiting for some verification before I put my name in the actual publication down. But to give you guys an idea, this is a similar chart. We have a buffer pH, maybe 6.3. And if you want a pH of 5.5, we're recommending 2.4 tons. <coughs> if we back up, um, I forgot to point this out. The, the data on individual environments looks great, but when you put it in one contiguous chart, it starts looking odd. Because this environment of 6.1 is more acidic than an environment of 6.3. So in order to get a pH of 5.5, this should have more lime than that environment, okay? So that's where I say when things are thrown together, it doesn't look quite right. So we did some more stuff, and we came up with this where there's a good flow. If you notice, each of those recommendations are at least one ton. So here's the reason why. With beet lime anyways, when we had half a ton, we slightly acidified the soil, 5.3 versus 5.4. One ton, no change of pH. Also, when we look at aluminum, there's a hair more of aluminum with that slight application of beet lime. Here's what's going on. If you took a whiff of this, it's going to have a slight sweet smell. There is also some organic residues in there. I think we're spiking microbial activity, and we're getting a little bit more mineralization going on, which is having a short-term acidification impact. So if you only want to put down half a ton of lime, you need to use a straight lime product and not some sort of byproduct like this, okay? Uh, our Olson phosphorus tests increased as we increased that, so maybe there's some value for a phosphorus fertilizer from this. Um, our, cata our calcium carbonate equivalents we looked at as well in the fall, and what this shows, two tons is similar to the zero treatment so we're, we're reacting about two tons of lime with the soil over the course of one growing season. So some of the questions that we're going to try to work on to answer yet is if the recipe comes back as four tons, should I make one application of four tons or should I make two applications of two tons? Because maybe the stuff could blow away. You know, it's Minnesota sucks, right? It's windy in the Dakotas. So um, that's where uh, we are with that. The other thing is, as we increased our lime treatments, we generally decreased um, that organic matter. And so we've also done some field scale work where, where we're in the process of trying to verify the recipe. Um, that the beet lime from Sydney, Montana, which is about a 200 mile haul, it's $50 a ton. We're using manure spreaders to apply, $10 a ton to apply it. The first time we tried some field scale stuff was up in Minot where we had the horizontal manure beaters, and the application was terrible. You know, when you forgot to buy a, a new toothpaste tube the other day and you're squeezing as hard as you can, sometimes it comes out, sometimes it doesn't. That's what it looked like behind this thing with that horizontal beater. 
but when we use a vertical beater, the uniformity is much, much better. Okay, so the who, what, where's, and why's of North Dakota soil acidity. The who is hydrogen. The what is lime to fix it, or a carbonate. The where, soil acidity is caused from fertilizer management, we're seeing it in that zone of fertilizer being placed at the same depth year after year. And the why is nitrogen mineralization. So in summary, you want to pair zone sampling uh, with a shallower um, soil test. Again, you're still going to want a zero to six for that um, for, for those for those nutrients. Lime, not gypsum, is going to raise pH. And we had a bunch of good looking data, but when we put it on one chart, all of a sudden things started looking goofy. Uh, one to two tons uh, of calcium carbonate can react with our soil over the course of one growing season when it's surface applied. And those crop and variety selections, they're going to help, especially your rented acres. And that's where we get the biggest questions from um, and, and people wanting to manage pH. They're doing it on their owned acres, but not necessarily on those rented acres because of that investment. Um, fixing it, when you look at some of the data, we're looking at maybe a 10-year uh, benefit and then slowly it'll acidify again, but that's going to be dependent on your crop rotations. If you're running canola on wheat continuously where you have lots of nitrogen and lots of AMS, you're going to acidify those soils a lot more than if you have wheat with uh, some sort of legume and sunflower and things like that. The diverse rotations are going to definitely slow down that, pro that reacidification process. Uh, so with that, uh, what questions do you have? This is what carbonates look like. These are my twins. They're now eight, and I like to think they're discussing about carbonates and soil acidity. Yes, sir. So the question is, is it better to put down one, you know, if you're way at the top of the recipe where you might need eight tons, should I do that in one application or should I break it up? Um, with that sort of cost, because uh, we've looked at agricultural lime in North Dakota, it was 150 bucks a ton delivered to Dickinson. So even though the beet lime has about half the amount of lime, it's still 50 bucks a ton less when you, when you think about it, that, right? Um, so with that amount of investment, I would probably want to break it up into a couple. It's going to make your loan officer a lot happier, those sorts of things. Um, but that's a question that we're going to try to get answered in the next year or two. Do we put on the, you know, the, way, the, the really high treatment right away, or should we put some on this year, soil test again, and then you know, make another decision? Because you know, as you let that acidity issue linger, you're hurting yourself on, on your yields too. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so the question... Sure, so the question is if you had a pH of 7.5 and you added more lime, what's going to happen? Um, we have lots, we have millions of acres that are getting beet limed in eastern North Dakota year after year because they have to use the stuff from the factories, okay? Um, they don't see much of an increase of soil pH, and that goes back to that logarithmic scale. Uh, they're actually seeing benefits in their, their sugar beets. It's cutting down on a phanomyces, and we're also seeing instances up in the Langdon area, Venkat Chapara, uh, with club root canola, they're cutting down on some of those diseases with lime impacts. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we initiated a study in Williston this fall, if it's cutting down on a phanomyces on sugar beets, can we cut down on a phanomyces of field peas and lentils? That's one of the biggest issues that our pulse crops are dealing with uh, in North Dakota. So stay tuned for that. But those in the Red River Valley, you might see it bump up a little bit, but I'd have a hard time believing you're going to jump it up to eight all of a sudden because of that logarithmic scale and how the math all works out. Yep. It, it, yeah, well, once you start getting those pHs above five, you might be farming pure calcium carbonate at that point, or maybe you have one of those sodium issues because there's a lot of hydroxide associated with sodium under those conditions.
Ja, en... Yeah. And, and, and that's because you, you got carbonates in those areas is why, you know, on those eroded knolls like that. The other thing is if you're spending $200 an acre, do you want to turn the spreader off when going across those areas? I know when I'm thinking about it, that's how many more shad wraps I get to buy if I can turn off my, my spreader in those areas. Sure. Well, are you going to hurt your pH? Probably not, though. I, I, I would think so. That's definitely not the limiting factor in that environment. If there was a six inch soil test, let's say we got a viable pH, um, obviously if it's zero three, there's going to be some that's in the fours. Mm -hmm. What kind of yield process do you think we're going to see on corn and wheat or soybeans? Sure. Uh, so with soybeans, um, well, I got that chart. I didn't talk too much about that chart. Yes, most of our soils... We got the same parent materials as you guys. Our soils are a little bit newer just because, you know, the glaciers left us a couple thousand years after they left South Dakota. But um, our soils are very similar. Um, but barley, when, when you get to a pH of about 5, all of a sudden expect about a 60% yield. Um, when I talked about those different varieties of wheat, you have the high tolerance wheat shown in the orange. You know, you can still get about 80% of that yield once you get to 80, or a pH of 5. But if you have a, a low tolerance wheat, all of a sudden you're looking like 50%. Like uh, one of the big wheats that we see growing in the acid areas is Lanning, which is a variety from Montana State. Um, Soren a year or two ago is our most common wheat, SY Soren. And um, on a good condition, I want to raise that Soren. That looks really good. I'm going to be calling the grain cart a bunch, which if you like soil compaction, that's a really good thing to do. <laughs> we don't allow grain carts on our field. Um, but um, under those acid conditions, all of a sudden, it flip-flops with the amount. I, I don't think this one, this one does have soil. 61 bushel versus this one doesn't have, this one doesn't have, the, oh, it does have the landing. It's like a four, four or five bushel difference. But if we were in a good condition, all of a sudden, that soil is... We see that close to 70 in the landing, you know, probably be in that 60 range. Yes, sir. You're talking about zero two, zero three soil samples, which seem kind of tedious. Gets monotonous. What, what's the status of like on the go soil sensors that might map the field? Sure. So, so are you guys familiar with the thing called a varus? It's like a little toolbar, discs, you drive around the field, it tells you what your ECR is, right? Or what your electrical conductance or how saline the soil is. They got implements on there now that every 20 feet or so, it's going to take a slug of soil and test it. And it does it very similar to how you would do it in the lab. There are other things out there when you see the quick phosphorus, nitrogen tests and stuff like that. It's using lasers and all sorts of things. I don't have faith in that stuff. But something like a varus, I do. Um, we just got a varus. Uh, this last fall, and at some point between now and hopefully this spring, I'm going to have a pH thing on it so I can map out every one of our fields at the research center to identify those acres. Something like that I got faith in. The moment you throw lasers in it, I, that's for Star Wars, not farming. Any other questions, guys? Ooh, ooh, Dwayne. Yep. And you got lime underneath, like a lot of our westward soils are the old ocean bottom, blue field soils. And guys here, when they go, you know, a couple feet deep, you've got three lines. Mm -hmm. So if you put it back in clearing the grass, it seems like a pH comes right back up. It comes right back up, or does it come up about 20 years? I, I could see some benefit from perennials. 
one thing, you're not putting the nitrogen fertilizer down, so you're not pouring gas on the fire, but perennial perennials, deeper rooted crops like that can bring up those sorts of things, yes. I, I haven't seen anything for the stud that compare the speed. That's why my, my thought, I'm thinking like a 10, 20 year time frame. But if you do it in five years, right, that might work out for some producers. You gotta graze it though to spike that that root growth and encourage it. I'd be happy to shoot the pheasants on any of that to help with research. Anything well, else, guys? Well, thank you very much for this. Thank you. Appreciate that.